I'm just setting up the recording at the moment. Here we go. All right, for those just joining us at the moment, welcome. Uh, we're just letting a few more people in as we go. So thank you for your patience. Getting very excited now. <laughs> So I'm going to just start off with a few housekeeping items as um, we've got people um, filtering in and we're going to imagine that we're on the back deck at Avid Reader with the beautiful lights and the, the bougainvillea all in flower at the moment as it would be in beautiful September weather. Um, so Cass, are you okay to um, admit people? I'm admitting I... people as you're talking. So Lovely. Thank you Go very ahead. much. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So before we get started with introductions, um, and uh, we'll, as we're letting everyone in, um, so firstly, if you haven't attended an online event with Avid Reader before, uh, please note that all attendees are placed on mute for the conversation um, and for our Q&A. However, at the end, we'll allow everyone to unmute themselves so we can join together in thanking our special authors. Uh, for the tech side of things, because everyone's on a different computer or device um, and we'll have different settings, there's a bit of a crowd tonight as well. So we unfortunately can't what? offer um, technical support during the event. Uh, if you have your settings to speak of you, the two guest speakers will take up the screen space. To see everyone's beautiful faces, simply switch over to gallery view. Uh, and there is a chat function built into Zoom that you can use to communicate directly with your host, um, myself. So when this evening speakers call for audience questions, um, so that time will come. Um, this is when you should type them in, otherwise, um, so I can read them out aloud and Thank share you. them. Um, but please, in the meantime, um, feel free to um, ask, ask away in the chat function. Uh, send your questions through at any time and um, we can't promise to get to everyone's, but I will do my very best. <coughs> All right. So now, how are we looking, Cass? Yeah, just letting a few more people in. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and do a little welcome. Um, so good evening, everyone. Welcome to this very special event tonight. My name is Bianca Milroy. I'm a writer and a proud member of the Avid Reader community. And it's my pleasure to be your host tonight. I'll officially start the event with an acknowledgement of country. And I'd like you to join me from wherever you may be. When we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, we pay respects to those past, present, and emerging. We acknowledge this land was never ceded and has always been and will always be a place of creativity and community and, community and of rich storytelling. From where I call home, Mianjin or Brisbane, I pay respect to the Yagara and the Turrbal people. I'd now like to introduce our in conversation guest tonight the wonderful Cass Moriarty, who is the author of The Promised Seed and Parting Words. Cass is also a literary judge, a reviewer, and a regular interviewer of Avid Reader's Zoom events. You can find Cass online at cassmoriarty.com and connect with her on Twitter at Moriarty Cass. So over to you, Cass. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. And welcome everybody to another Avid Reader online Zoom event bringing together, of course, readers, writers, and the literary community. Um, just wanted to mention again, as I usually do at the start of these events, that uh, in these COVID times, social media is keeping authors, publishers, and booksellers thriving. So if you enjoy tonight's event, do spread the word, buy a book or two or three, uh, follow the authors on social media, um, and help support the writing community. That would be really helpful. So tonight we are absolutely thrilled to welcome to Avid Reader, author and activist, Sarah Wilson. Sarah is a former journalist and TV presenter and her I Quit Sugar movement inspired millions worldwide and made her a New York Times international best-selling author. Two years ago, she closed that business and donated all the money to charity and she is now focusing on exploring how to live a better life. Her book, First, We Make the Beast Beautiful, examined anxiety. And her new book, which I have here, looking very special, asks the question, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? 
Sarah lives minimally. She's an obsessive hiker and is known for traveling the world for eight years with one bag, which is very impressive. She campaigns for climate action, mental health and human connection. And she campaigns against racial injustice and consumerism. Welcome, Sarah, to Avid Reader. Thank you so much for having me. And excuse the random cat that keeps walking across the screen. It's not my cat. It's some neighbour's cat that just likes to come and hang out in my apartment. It kind of... We love random cats at Avid. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, everyone else, if you feel you just want to climb through my window and, and hang out. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> Although we can't cross borders at the moment. Um, Sarah, let's get started because um, I've got so much to ask you and, you know, we've only got an hour to do it and we want to leave some time for questions at the end. Um, your book is described as a hopeful path forward in a fractured world. So I thought I'd start with a big question. What do you think is broken in the world today? Um, predominantly, I think we, uh, what's broken is our connection. Um, and not just to each other. In fact, the connections that we have with each other are always saturated in a particular kind of way. What's more concerning is that we have a disconnection from ourselves, um, but we also have a lack of connection or meaningful connection to meaning and to life's value and the stuff that really counts. And I include in that this notion of life, life as we treasure it. So I think there's a lot of discussion at the moment about the problems in the world, whether we blame, um, you know, disconnection through social media, technology more broadly, loneliness. Um, we point the finger at all of these things, but really what it comes down to is a lack of meaningful connection. And I think that that's what's tearing at our spirits and is at the core of um, a lot of the pain that is happening at a global level. Mm. I, I've got a quote here where you actually use the term, we're in a state, or many of us are in a state of spiritual PTSD, which I think, you know, summarises that perfectly. Yeah, and PTSD suggests that we, um, we're in a state of shock, um, obviously, but it, it always suggests that there's something missing, something that we um, used to have and we no longer have, something that we treasured. There's a sense of grief I think, in, involved in PTSD. There's something that we've lost. And um, I think it is that spiritual connection, that sense of what, of what matters. And, you know, I'm sure you're going to get, I don't want to jump ahead to your various questions, but I'm sure you're going to break it down. Um, but I have a bunch of reasons, um, or I've explored a bunch of reasons as to why I think that has in fact happened. And of course, you know, as you know, Cass, I set out to write this book. I'd written um, First We Make the Beast Beautiful about my internal anxiety. And um, that was an exploration that was really fruitful for me. And as somebody said to me, a friend of mine said to me, and I write this in first, we make the beast beautiful, why the hell are you writing this book? And I wrote it because I wanted to feel less alone, less alone in this anxious pain. And um, so first we make the beast beautiful actually cured things, or at least helped me modulate things um, incredibly because it made me feel less alone. The book achieved what I wanted it to achieve for me and hopefully the same thing for others. Um, it started the conversation that I felt we were all craving. But after, you know, I mean, it's been out three years now and I was looking around and, of course, as you mentioned in your intro, I've been a climate activist and I was seeing what was happening to the planet and I was seeing that there was, a, there was an anxiety that was occurring outside of us globally in the collective. It was no longer just a personal internal journey that needed to be gone on and it needed to go outwards. And the conversations that I felt were required to get us to a humane, meaningful level again, so that we can then save this one wild and precious life weren't happening. And um, again, all I'd set out to do was to have a better conversation around that, um, to deep dive and um, hopefully emerge with some ideas and as you know, I, sound, hmm, sorry. Yeah, it sounds like the, you know, that was a natural progression then from the your first book, which was sort of internally focused to this book, which is all about connection with other people. And as you said, it covers things like climate, um, the climate crisis, political polarization, um, racial injustice, and 
of course, you've even in, managed to include COVID in there, so you, which you yes. must have done at the last minute. But um, yeah, and I will, I, we will talk about a few of those things in, yeah. in more depth and break them down. Um, I wanted to start by asking you that the book began with the working title of Wake the Fuck Up. <laughs> what, what did you, sorry, language warning I should have given before we said that. What did you struggle with as you tried to pinpoint what exactly you wanted to write about? When you oh, I mean, I knew I wanted to identify what I refer to in the first chapter as an itch, this itchy feeling, because it wasn't just pain, it wasn't just anxiety, because uh, about everything that's going on, you know, the overwhelm of it all. There was also a sense that a creeping, itchy sense that we were all complicit. So, you know, generally when we're dealing with big overwhelming problems, there's um, generally an enemy. There was somebody we could blame, whether it's a war or whatever it is, you know. Even when we've got anxiety, you know, uh, there's been a, a polemic for a long time to be able to <laughs> blame our parents, blame something, you know. And um, I think with this issue and all the issues that were happening, um, there was no one to blame. We are both the perpetrator and the victim in all of this. So this was the itch. And what I felt was happening is that because that in itself was so overwhelming, we had never encountered that before. We didn't have the conversation tools. We didn't have the leaders who were discussing it. We didn't have the moral framework for it because all of the structures that used to guide us morally have disintegrated, you know, whether we, the church, oh, there's this damn cat. This is Banjo, everybody. I've learned its name because he goes missing on Facebook every now and then, the, the Facebook group, and um, everyone knows where Banjo is. Um, I'll just have him on my lap. Um, so what was happening is that people were feeling so overwhelmed and um, going into a state of what I call acedia. I don't call it that. It's a term that's been around since the ancient Greeks and it was resurfaced with um, Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century and then more recently with the philosopher Eric Fromm in the context of sort of the inertia around nuclear threat in the 1950s and 60s. And I feel that that's the state we've gone into again, this state of what um, is described as listless sloth, which is a very hard thing to say when you have a list like I do. Um, and so, so that's the danger. That's the space that we often go into when we're this overwhelmed, when we're this aware that we are complicit in this, as well as a victim of it. And so the reason why I was working with the title, Wait the Fuck Up, I was just like, come on, everybody. You know, I, I wanted to shake humanity. Like, we're watching the destruction of the planet. And even if you have your doubts about the climate science, um, you can't ignore the fact that koalas are becoming extinct. The animals of our children's picture books are becoming extinct. You can't ignore what's going on. You can't ignore the fact that we're consuming, some figures say, seven and a half times um, the size of planet Earth. That is not sustainable, you know? When you use things up, they run out. We know this. So um, I wanted to use that. I then decided I needed to soften a bit um, because one of the things I explored was the fact that aggression was not going to work. Um, the climate movement had used a lot of sort of full-on sort of anger and frustration, which is completely understandable. If anyone's feeling anger and frustration, um, then that's completely understandable. But I felt that what we needed to do was actually come together. So here I was writing a book about reconnecting. I knew that that was the essence of where we were going wrong. So the best thing I could do was to ensure I used inclusive language in the title of my book as a bare minimum. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm, I'm, I'm sure your publishers are glad you changed the title. And besides, <laughs> the word fuck in a, in a book title is completely overused, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. I think they've done that. There's a book that's done that. That and the word <laughs> Paris. Paris and the word, you just have to have Paris and the word fuck in the title and everyone thinks they're going to be able to sell a book. <laughs> All right, now let me change tack here a little bit um, because I want to talk about something else in the book that is really important to you and that is hiking and communing with the natural world, which comes across to me anyway, as being as necessary to you as breathing. Um, your book features hikes that you've completed throughout the world and, and you take us um, through several of those in the book. And I wanted to ask you, what, what are some of your favorite places to hike? 
And what are some of the most important lessons you've learned or epiphanies you've had while you're hiking? It seems like it's a very special time for you when yeah. you're out in nature. It is. Um, and I'll, I'll take the opportunity to explain a little bit why I used hiking in the book as a sort of a through line. Uh, many of you are readers and no doubt some of you are writers, so you might find it semi-interesting. Um, but um, yes, hiking for me has been a salve from a, when, a, when I was a little girl um, and my anxiety would rear and I would just get out and often climb trees. And I still, at the age of 46, climb trees. Um, and I used to climb up high and, and just watch the world, you know? There was this distance I could get. Um, I, I, <sighs> I felt at home, particularly on a mountain, so that answers a little bit of your, one of your questions, um, mountains where I can get a perspective. And I describe it in one of my walks, Nan Shepherd refers to her relationship with mountains and it's a book that I carry with me on. Throughout, the, the, uh, throughout this One Wild and Precious Life, I use hikes to sort of explore different philosophers and, and different quite heavy concepts. And I figured that it was a sexy way to bring the reader along. I mean, I say, it, fortunately, I discuss the heaviest topic, the destruction of my, well, my pulling apart of neoliberalism, um, following the footsteps of my favorite childhood character, Heidi. And I know that many of you may have read the book. Um, it was turned into a, a movie with Shirley Temple um, as well, a Disney movie. Um, so yes, I use hiking as a little bit of a device, but I, I hike to, I realise, tame my anxiety. It was a way, and I just intuitively knew that it worked. And I did it from a very young age and I've done it um, on my own in different parts of the world from when I was a teenager. And, um, this book, I found myself hiking as I explored different ideas. And then I realized I got to this point where I got very stuck in what was gonna actually be my solution, not only to the climate crisis and everything that was going on, but also you know, the, the salve that I was gonna provide in my book. And I don't, I don't like to be didactic in my books. I like to invite readers to explore a concept that worked for me. Anyway, so I go off on a hike as I do when I'm stuck and I hiked and I hiked and I went hard. And all of a sudden the answer came to me, it is going straight back to nature. We're disconnected from nature. We're disconnected from our true nature. Why beat around the bush, so to speak? Go straight to it. Do not pass go, you know? Um, and I realised that then there was a lot of science and that could actually explain um, in terms of words like attunement. So we have fractals in our eyes that work to certain patternings. And then we have fractals in nature that appear in shells and, and tidal pools, right? And so we go out into nature and that fractal attunement brings us a connection that makes us feel like we are in the right place, you know? I mean, that's a beautiful, wonderful scientific or biological way of explaining it. Um, and then, I, you know, sort of there's the science of how our, the part of the brain that controls the left-right motion is also the part of the brain that modulates the flight or fight mechanism, um, the anxious mechanism. But it also um, controls our discerning thought. So we became deeper thinkers as we emerged upright, you know, onto two feet and started walking. And so walking goes at the pace of discerning thought. So, so that is why so many thinkers, philosophers, poets, um, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, walk, think out the deep concepts. And what we are lacking today, I feel, is good, deep, discerning thought. Part of our overwhelm is that so much is coming in, we can't piece it out and find a morally true path through it. So hiking was my style. I then realised how hiking could become our self. Now, to answer your question, what are my favourite places to hike? Mountains. And then I would also say the desert. And funnily enough, I don't actually have that many. I only have one sort of arid landscape hike in the book. Um, it just turned out I didn't have enough room for that many hikes. But actually, no, two, two arid lands landscapes. Um, one was Sierra Nevada and the other is Joshua Tree. Um, but I also have done the Lara Pinto. I've done quite a bit of uh, hiking in the Australian desert. And um, 
it's the sparseness. And I talk about awe in the book and, and how, again, there's this attunement that happens as well with awe and, and uh, nature brings us to that place. <laughs> Mountains and deserts. So if you had to choose one place to go back to for your, for your final hike, where would it be? Well, it's a bit like that. If you're in, if you're in the on death row, what's your final meal? Mm, yeah, often, that one often. Um, should you should you care? It would be a pork chop and steamed zucchini. Not very exciting, but you know, <laughs> um, and a lot of red wine, really good red wine. Um, I would go back to the Australian desert. Mm. I would go back to the Australian desert and um, and just yeah, the vastness and the. I mean, I come back to Australia. I lived as a nomad for eight years and um, just out of one bag. But what brings me back to Australia is the land. Um, you know, I, I feel at home in the rocks and the dirt and the ocean here. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. When you were talking about um, the connection between walking and thinking, I was thinking of the philosopher's walk in Kyoto which is definitely not a hike, but it's a, you know, it's an easy walk and it's, um, you know, the fact that it's called the philosopher's walk. Um, and I wanted to ask you about forest bathing um, and how does that connect to resilience and endurance? Yes. So forest bathing emerged sort of in the 1980s in Japan and South Korea when, um, and in, as a sort of a, almost a health measure, and in fact, it's part of their health policy and insur health insurance policies and that kind of thing. In South Korea, they ship um, delinquent children out to the forest to cure them of their, of their bullying or, or whatever it might be. Um, but I think it's about 40,000 studies that have been done into the effects of just walking in a forest. And um, so in the book, I actually do um, one of the pilgrimage walks from um, down south of Kyoto. And it's a beautiful walk. Um, it was pretty gnarly, that one. It was a pilgrimage walk that was designed to basically break you one way or another. Um, you know, either you gave in and died out there or you became very strong as a result. So I went and found this monk um, and uh, chased him down. Like literally I hiked for four days to find him in this particular mountain village. I get there, we head off hiking and he's never heard of forest bathing. It's hilarious. Um, so um, I've travelled all this way, but in the end, what he did was talk to me about what he'd learned from this tradition and why... So this particular type of monk, um, it's sort of a Shinto, part of the Shinto religion. Um, they, uh, as part of their training and part of their practice, they run up mountains. That is what they do. And it is to practice, as you say, endurance and resilience. Because they believe that that enduring, that, that holding fast, which anybody who's a hiker and has walked up really steep mountains where you have to get there because accommodations at the top or over the pass, you know. Um, you know, you've got to go to a part of your entity which you don't meet, you know, at any other time. Um, so the endurance piece um, takes you down into this deep part of yourself where you have to forget um, and block out the, the surface stuff. And you have to come into a real connection um, with a, a strength and a resilience and it's practice. And one of the things I explore, Cass, as you know, in the book is the fact that, you know, and I was asked to go and speak actually at the National Press Club at the end of last year about anxiety in children. And, and I looked into it and I delved into it and I hadn't actually looked into it in First We Make the Beast Beautiful in great detail. And what I found when I researched it for this talk was that um, we don't have a, an epidemic of anxiety amongst children. We have an epidemic of a lack of resilience. Mm. You know, we've cocooned children, but we've equally cocooned ourselves from discomfort. Now, we've cocooned ourselves horribly, ironically, from everything except for real life, because real life is about discomfort. It is about having to sit in uncertainty. And more so than ever right now, as we know, we have got unprecedented uncertainty and yet we are entirely ill-equipped for dealing with it. And so, yes, this idea of forest bathing and one of the benefits, one of the, you know, probably a good 
couple of thousand of the studies, um, look into the correlation between enduring resilience, practicing that as an art form in order to become happier, more engaged, more capable humans in everyday life. Mm. Yeah. Mm. In the book, you introduced me to a lot of new words that I actually hadn't heard of before. One of them you just mentioned earlier, is it acedia? Yeah. yeah. I've got a couple of others here, but um, perhaps other people haven't heard of either. And I wondered if you could very quickly just give us a little definition. Um, philotemo? Uh, so philotemo? Philotemos. Philotemos? Yeah. Philotemos is another Greek word. Anyone who's out there who's Greek, um, or knows a Greek person, you'll know the love of a Greek to say, ah, that's a Greek word. <laughs> um, and so there's quite a few Greek words in the, in the book. Um, Philotomos is a beautiful word. And in fact, um, etiologists have, have said that there's no other um, language that can find an equivalent for this word. It's uniquely Greek. And it roughly translates as the love of honour. And it's, it's, um, it's the practice of giving to strangers. So I, it happens to me every time I go to Greece, like, and it's why I keep going back. It's my sort of spiritual home. And, um, and, and it's the idea of not giving to a stranger because you think you're going to get something back. It's because you believe you've already received, mm -hmm. which is the most beautiful concept. Mm -hmm. And now that might sound like sort of, you know, jingoism. It might sound all a bit Pollyanna-ish. But anyone who's spent some time in Greece, you really do pick up on the fact that this is part of their culture, it's part of their moral fibre. And I spoke to lots of Greeks about it and they said, we just grow up with this kind of thinking. It's not a big deal. And indeed, I think I say it in the book, it's not like you enter Athens airport and there's billboards, you know, welcome to the land of Philotomos. I mean, it's not like they wear it as a badge of honour. It's just what they do because they believe they've already received the benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm. I saw it at play, I passed through um, Kos, the island of Kos, at one point, just as the Syrian crisis had happened. So there were heaps of Syrian refugees, you know how they were washed up on the beaches and all of that kind of thing, and there was that famous image of the child who was washed up. Um, and so there were camps where these people were being kept, and the entire island, I mean, I think the, there were there was quite a few locals that were put forward as the Nobel Peace Prizes for this work that they did. And that's just what they did. They fed, they shared their, their limited food and resources with these people, no questions asked. Um, so yes, that was a long answer. That was my long response. That was a, that was, yeah, I'm glad I didn't ask for the long, the long response. Mm, yeah. I don't think I'll go through all of the other words. Um, there's, there's black swan. Maybe if I tell you some of them and you can pick one or two. Black okay. swan. Um, Connection light, hyper objects, oh, yeah. soul nerd, ADA, and one I had heard of, solastalgia. Well, solastalgia is actually a term that was developed by an Australian um, environmentalist based up in the Hunter Valley, and he developed it. It's the homesickness for, for nature. Um, so I think um, it's, and it's the grief that we feel um, when we see nature being destroyed. And it's a word that's actually been picked up around the world. But he, um, Greg Einwright, I think his name is, but he, it was um, Hunter Valley is an area in uh, New South Wales um, where there's a lot of gas um, drilling and mining and a lot of the landscape's been destroyed. So that's, that's I think, a beautiful word, the grief or homesickness. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. An adder is um, a West Bengalese term for a long group conversation generally held um, over cups of tea in sort of public places where people talk about the deep stuff, you know, the deep stuff. So I encourage people to have adders or to hold book clubs like we are here as opportunities to go deeper and to talk into this stuff. And that feeds into soul nerd. It's one of the chapters, I, and it's one of my suggestions, you know, um, for how to circumnavigate this disconnect, mm. become mm. a soul nerd. And so, um, you know, we've got spirituality, we've got religion, and then there's this idea of studying the, the deeper aspects of human art and literature and poetry mm. and science mm. and so on for the purposes of connecting. Mm. Mm. So you actually quote, um, speaking about, literature, you quote or you reference the poet Rumi quite a lot um, in the book. 
uh, specifically his words, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. This was a real coincidence for me because I actually used that poem in my last novel. I, I love that, that couple of lines. What's the significance of the words to you and how do you use them in the book? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's this idea that we can go backwards and forwards and I think it sums up, I mean, those words were met, written many hundreds of years ago um, and yet today I think they're more pertinent than ever. The fragmentation that's been going on is at the heart of our itch. Political fragmentation, democracies um, on the downhill slide, um, and we are caught up. Uh, we watch our leaders caught up in tick for tack thinking. And, and Einstein is slightly incorrectly quoted um, as saying that we will never solve a problem with the same consciousness that caused it in the, in the first place. And the con consciousness that has caused this problem is that neoliberal idea of the individual fighting other individuals to, to, you know, to get ahead, you know, and it's this you versus me, us versus them mentality rather than a collective uh, way of thinking. And so I feel that, the, uh, you know, we're despairing because we are going round and round in circles mm. talking rights and wrongs when what we all need to do is to find our common point um, we, we need to meet in that field. And, you know, I say this a couple of times over, I think, in the book. Um, whether you're a climate denialist, a Trump supporter, climate activist, whether you're um, a nurse, um, you know, working at the COVID front line, whatever your positioning is, we are all feeling the same collective itch. We are all feeling fragmented. And... As you said... as. Sorry, as you say in the book, you quote Olivia Lang, who says loneliness is a populated place, which I think yeah, is, yeah. you know, is what you're saying. Yeah. And, I, and I think I follow up and say, and it's hit bursting point in the last you know, couple of years. Um, and it, but as I say, I distinguish my understanding of loneliness because we often confuse aloneness and loneliness. Mm -hmm. and I think the, the more painful loneliness is that notion of Celia. That moral, that moral, moral loneliness. Yeah. That's right. And it's a disconnect from that moral fabric. Um, again, because of this neoliberal separatism, um, this idea that we're all sort of individual economic units, you know, um, and it's a way of thinking that goes against the grain of our humanity. Mm. And it's going to have a magicalness in humanity. And humanity has a magicalness of, about it. It's going to have to be that magicalness. The magicalness that can see a 50-kilo mother lift a car off her toddler. I mean, we, we hear these stories, right? We know mm. they happen. Those magic moments happen, and they happen when, when we are fully connected to our humanity. Mm. Mm. I've got pages and pages of questions here and our time is, is running out. So I'm just trying to decide what to go to next. Um, we're talking, I guess you touched on capitalism there. In the book, you do call capitalism a cult. Um, how do you think each of us can, can contribute to addressing that problem, the, the over-consumerism? Um, I, I get sort of frustrated almost because um, my answer is just don't go to the shops, right? And another answer I have is get rid of your car. Like when you get rid of your car, you're forced to, well, not go to the shops because it's a schlep to the mall, right? I mean, it really helps me. I, I've, I've, I ride a single speed bike and I live at the bottom of a hill. So um, it is a great disincentive for going to the shops. But we, we, we have to do it from a moral point of view. But again, I feel that draconian measures, I mean, humans, we see a wet paint, paint do not touch sign and all we want to do is touch it. I, with my book, have tried to actually really extol the charming virtues of not shopping and being a minimalist. And so I go to quite lengths to, to sort of show how flowy and beautiful and elegant life becomes when you're not bogged down in that mentality of more, more, more. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I really try to appeal to people via sort of a philosophical or sort of a feeling as opposed to telling people they shouldn't do it because that doesn't work, you know. Um, and then, you know, coupled with a moral awareness, 
around using a takeaway coffee cup and knowing full well it goes to landfill, um, then the two can work together to, to, come to bring about change. Mm. But consumerism, we know the studies as well, it's empty. It is, it, and it's like a cult because it keeps us in this false promise cycle where we become indebted, i.e. through credit card debt and mortgages, to this false promise that never delivers and we're stuck in it. Plus, we honestly don't think that there's any other model beyond it. And so when I talk about the fact that I have problems with capitalism, everyone's like, well, what else is there? What, you're a communist? And I'm like, no, there are a plethora of other economic ideas out there, donut economics, degrowth economics. Mm -hmm. These are exciting new theories that are beyond the capitalist cult-ish mindset. And I think in the book you take us through a lot of options and suggestions for how to live that sort of different wild and precious life. You talk about how crucial it is to look someone in the eye and say, I get you. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about big kindness and why that's important. You talk about um, which is more important to be right or to be loved. Um, you talk about going to your edge and getting into trouble. So all of these are things that are covered in the book um, that we don't have time to go into, but that people, you know, they're in that book. Yeah, that will cover it in detail. <laughs> they're in there and you need to go and read them. Um, here's a question for you. Why is the figure 3.5% significant to you? Um, so there was a study done um, a few years back, um, I think in 2016. Um, Erica Chenworth is her name. She did a study of every peaceful protest that had been conducted from 1900 to 2014. And what she found was that um, when a protest movement got 3.5% of any population, so 3.5% of a given town or 3.5% of a given workplace, um, the change would come about. So at the moment, so many of us, and I was looking into that sort of in September last year, you know, when there was the big um, school strike for climate, and it was, you know, it, it, there was a real push to try to get as many people as we could there. It was very, very powerful. We didn't quite get to 3.5%. But I was explaining to people, if we can get to 3.5% of the Australian population there, there's almost a guarantee that it tips over into critical mass and people wake up, politicians take note. And um, it's not a big percentage, is it? 3.5%. Three, three it's totally doable, right? <laughs> And all you've got to do is turn up to a protest and be peaceful. They're the two criteria. So, I mean, I just try to pull out as many of those hopeful messages that can encourage people to engage. And there's countless studies that show engagement begets engagement, action begets action. Um, and then um, what's more, um, it actually brings about this great sense of relief. It is the best salve for our anxiety is to be engaged. Um, it's also contagious. There's been some wonderful studies um, that show that when you're around people that are generous or kind or engaged in activism, you are more likely to, and it you know has a ripple on effect. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, three and a half percent is a very doable and um, hopeful number. Mm. And as you quote Anne Frank in the book, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Which is exactly what you're talking about. From a 15 year old girl who was stuck mm. in an attic and didn't she change the world? If yeah. she can, the rest of us certainly can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, we're going to go to questions maybe in about five minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll ask a couple of more things before we do that. Tell us about some of the amazing coincidences that have happened in your life. I have a reputation amongst <laughs> friends that I have done since I was a kid. They go, only that would happen to you. Um, and I sort of take it for granted. And I think I actually acknowledge in the book that almost every hike I go on seems to have this ridiculous sort of uh, conflation of events with a life lesson and and then that rounds off that chapter. Um, but I do think that when you hike in nature and you have that attunement, that kind of stuff just happens. And look, I don't think there's any such thing as coincidences. It's just about being alive and alert and generally 
unencumbered with stuff, materialist stuff, for you to notice, right? There's, I mean, everything's a coincidence. Everything's a conflation of energetic stuff. I mean, quantum physicists explain that to us now and can point to it, you know, in diagrams. Um, I guess one of the ones that uh, people tend to like is um, I'd been... I'd been writing the book and I was stuck and I'd been emailing everyone and it's no big secret, I have bipolar. And so I go down these rabbit holes sometimes and I forget to emerge into polite society. <laughs> and I was emailing Oprah Winfrey. Hi, I was wondering if I could you know, interview you for my book. And I was just, you know, I was on this kind of grippy role where I was trying to grip at life and make things happen. And I was getting nothing back, like no emails at all from anyone for two weeks and I was going mad. So I know enough about myself that when I grip and strangle life like that, I've just got to back the fuck off. And I write about that in First We Make the Beast Beautiful is I you know, have a phrase, back the fuck off, release your grip. So I decided to do that. I shut my computer, put down my mouse, got on my bike and rode sort of to the other side of the suburb to a cafe. And I thought, I'll just take my notepad and paper and I'm gonna have, a, I'm gonna have no email checking for two days. I need to give this a bit of a circuit break. So I went there and as I was, you know, um, sitting down, you know, a thing came in from my US book agent saying, um, you know, Maria Shriver said no, she's traveling at the moment. And that's all I saw. I went, oh God, here we go. Another rejection from the universe. All right, let it go. So I sat down and these old ladies were sitting next to me. When I say old, I'll be fair here. They're in the late seventies, but they're awesome. They swim together every day and they do the cryptic crossword. And I caught them cheating at their cryptic crossword, flicking to the back of their little book and looking at their answers. So I started a conversation with them and then a staff member came in. I got delayed. You know, I was about to leave and I was delayed. And I went up to pay my bill and I looked up, Maria Shriver walked in. Now for anyone who doesn't know who Maria Shriver is, she's, um, she's one of the, um, Jackie Onassis family, she, or Jackie, sorry, Kennedy, she's a Kennedy, and she was married to Arnold Schwarzenegger. She was a well-known television host and news reporter. Um, she writes books. She does podcasts. She's, a, she's a, 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 an active Catholic and a beautiful spiritual voice. And so that's why I've been trying to interview her. Anyway, she walked in and I was like, this can't be right. And I'd literally just got that email from my agent. So... I Googled her and I knew that she, I'd seen her in Dubai. So I knew that her story that she's overseas at the moment held up, but I was like, what's she doing here? Anyway, I thought I'd better Google. And I always look at people's eyebrows and their rings to check if it's somebody, especially Hollywood people, because, you know, they've had all kinds of hairdos and makeup happening. And um, anyway, I checked on her Instagram. She was wearing the same rings. Anyway, I had to go over and tell her the story. So I told her the story. She thought it was wonderful. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, was, I felt I don't need to interview Maria Shriver anymore. I've got my story. <laughs> you, got, you absolutely got your story. Go and yeah. love in, right? That's the lesson. Absolutely. And the book is full of coincidences <laughs> yeah. like that. But just to finish off before we go to questions, um, I wanted to say that you're very open about your personal life in the book. Um, your dating experiences and your journey a few years ago to try and become a mum. How do you reconcile the sadnesses of those times with your outlook, your determined outlook to pursue joy? Yeah, um, I'm very public and yet I am a very private person. Um, you know, um, it's a seductive technique that I use. Um, however, I discuss topics that I think are universal and um, sort of the, the, the themes I discuss are things that are often not discussed and we always say we should talk about them more and then we say that people with a public profile should talk about them more. And here I was writing a book about going to your edge and opening up discussion for reconnection and, you know, I'd be a horrible hypocrite if I didn't go to my edge and really share um, some stuff that I felt we were, not everybody is busting to talk about, but at least it shows that when you bust to talk about something, it's worth doing, you know? Um, so how do I reconcile it? Well, I think sometimes when you've been down so low, I think this is a country and Western song, um, Paddy, I can't remember who sings it now, but Willie Nelson, I think, and somebody or other sing, um, when you've been down low, so low, it looks like up to me. 
And I think sometimes I've, um, I've been to some depths with my mental health. I have, um, you know, some, I, I have had to choose between uh, living and, and not living. And um, when you then choose to live, you know, and to really live, um, you, it's sort of a bit like writing a book, right? About not quitting, about not eating sugar. I can't walk down the street eating a Mars bar anymore. It holds me accountable. It's the same with writing a book. It's, a, it's the same with making a decision to live. And so um, if, if I do that, and if I decide to live my life in a different kind of way, I've got to own it. And, it, you know, and there's no conveyor belt. There's no easy path for people who live life the way I do. And so I, I believe, I've, I've, cons I've made a choice to live a more joyful life, a more meaningful life. I wake up every day committed to that. And I want other people to join me because I don't want to be so lonely out there. It's lonely, you know, at times. I despair, you know, at times. But what I've got to do, and my meditation teacher said this to me when I was in that stuck place before I went for that hike that made me realise this is the path. He said, Sarah, but you do enjoy this. Show us the joy. Show us the charm. Show us that this can be a better way. And um, so I feel a responsibility. So I've signed up to making this kind of look better than the other option. I've got to live it now. And it's the greatest gift I've given myself, you know, because I'm, I have to hold myself accountable. Mm. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, it might be easy for people who perhaps haven't read the book to say, oh, well, you know, it's easy for Sarah Wilson. She's got, you know, money, she's got freedom, she's got no commitments, whatever people, judgments people make about you because you're well known. Um, and wondering, you know, how, how can they apply these things to their own lives? But I think that you do cover that in the book. You talk about how this philosophy can really apply to all of us, whatever our situation and whatever our, our commitments or our, you know, the restrictions or the parameters of our and life. That therein lies your freedom. Your restrictions are your freedom. Mm -hmm. And Pima Chodron, I borrow the line from her, start where you are and where you are, whether you are a night shift worker, whether you are a single mum, whether you are a teenager despairing, that is your place to start to wake up. Mm -hmm. Waking up is the joyful experience yeah. you know yeah that's a great place i think to head for some questions bianca i've seen quite a few questions come in yes Cass, absolutely um so what i can it's very interesting too um i'm not sure if you've noticed the theme that there's a really clear i think section of hiking and then you know, I guess more more of the the writing and the um, you know all of the themes that the, the book encapsulates. So um, so thank you everyone for sending in those questions. Um, and I can only assume um, we were when um, uh, Sarah, you were talking about um, uh, basically making the choice to live and and being accountable for that. And Donna wanted to say that there was something in the Good Weekend magazine, um, an article by Trent Dalton was writing about that very thing um, in today's Good Weekend. So very moving. Um, so yeah, it's good to know that there's you know more of us having that conversation. And um, so I will go to our first question. Um, and this is from Tara East, and I know Tara, she's a fellow writer. We launched her book at Avid last year. <laughs> so thank you, Tara. And Tara wants to know, um, when you hike, do you hike alone or with others? And if both, how does the experience change? Love that question, Tara. Thank you. I'm predominantly hike on my own. Um, I am a loner. I'm a nomad. And I, that's, I struggle to find people to come with me, to be honest. Um, I'm at an age where most of my friends have children that have to be supervised and taken to soccer on weekends and that kind of thing. Um, so, but I, in the book, I actually do two, no, one hike with other people. Um, and I do it to challenge myself because there are benefits of hiking with others. And in fact, I explore it in quite detail. So it's a, the cradle hut walk in Tasmania that I do. And I do it in a large group. And they're people I would never meet apart from, you know, thrown together in this way. And um, I distinguish between walking on your own, and, well, walking on your own and walking with others. 
we emerged doing both as humans and both are very natural to us. We need to hike on our own to be alone with our thoughts and to fully embrace aloneness. Aloneness, and I think there's a spiritual quote that says to, to conquer loneliness, we need to be alone. And I think um, throughout history, people have headed off to hike on or walk on their own to be able to reconnect back in. And so you have a different type of thought um, and it, it, it churns out and it's unedited and it's really wonderful. Um, and most writers and thinkers hiked on their own for that kind of tumbling free thinking, Henry Miller, Nietzsche and so on. Hiking in a group is a very different thing. However, you eventually do find that the group conversation lulls into a lovely place, a certain rhythm, and you don't end up talking about sort of academic concepts necessarily, but it, 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 un, it bubbles along and it unfurls. And I describe it as almost undoing, like going through the trauma rings of a tree, you know? And each night on that hike, we'd sit down at the end of the day and we'd sit around and have a glass of wine on beanbags in front of the fire. I did the luxury version of the walk, by the way, which I don't usually do either. And, um, and there was this lovely openness. There was an absolutely lovely openness because people felt that they'd actually dug through a few trauma rings and we arrived at a point where we were all there. So it's a different kind of thing. And there's this kind of game where you've got to kind of understand where another person's thoughts are at and where's the right time to, to think. And you've got, you've got so much awareness to, of the dynamics of a group. You start to be aware of, oh, I want to interject and then you sort of fight that a little bit and you can correct yourself. And look, both processes make you a better human because you are alert and alive um, to things without the distraction. Mm, yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you, um, Tara. So following on from that question is a really good one from Jenny, um, Jenny Atreed. So um, Sarah, she says, I know many people who, unlike us, do not particularly like being in nature. Do you think they have just lost their connection um, to nature through its absence in their lives or are they fundamentally different to us? <laughs> well, I hope everyone out there is fundamentally different to me and um, to, to each other. Um, I'd say it's just lack of um, opportunity and access. Um, and not everybody wants to feel the discomfort of, you know, leeches and ants and all of that kind of thing but it is very much about just familiarity and feeling at ease um, and not everybody wants to be out in you know the bush per se but we're fortunate in Australia there's most places there's a park or there's a river or there's um, even just suburbia you know there's trees and there's birds and um, you don't have to go too far to actually get the benefits. And I have a chapter in the book called, uh, where one of the hikes is handed over to a flaneur, which is that sort of walk around um, a city you know, and it originated in Paris. Again, during a lot of, a lot of what I discuss occurred in the late 1800s when um, industrialization was being very heavily questioned because it was making people sick and depressed. And so a lot of these naturalist thoughts and, and um, counterculture thoughts were being discussed. And the flaneur was one of the things that emerged in that era. And the flaneur is where you just wander around a city with no aim but to observe. And so you have no direction, you have no end point. And uh, so people who are not into nature per se can still walk and be mindful. I think there was another question from somebody about urban. Yes, urban I was just water. about to. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. that's probably yeah. answered that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we did have a question about the possibilities of hiking within an urban environment. Um, that's from Donna. Donna McDonald um, says, you know, we don't all get to travel. And I guess particularly in the circumstances we're in, there's restricted travel um, to say Uluru or um, Broome. Um, and yes, a local place in Brisbane that we um, tend to like to hike is right near Mount Kutha. Um, JC Slaughter Falls is one of my um, 
local nature spots as well to get in touch because you know I'm right in the middle of the CBD and so getting out to nature is something that you know requires that bit of effort and a bit more time and planning we um yeah so I just guess walk out your front door I mean that's the other thing is that um even just 20 minutes walking around the block can actually have incredible psychological benefits and Virginia Woolf used to walk in the city so she used to love walking at night in London um and so different thinkers have certainly walked in urban areas yeah um, and a specific question, this will be, a, um, I think, a specific answer as well. Um, so Sal says, um, Sarah, when you said you would go back to the Australian desert, where have you hiked under this definition? Um, I've gone through, I've spent a bit of time in Kakadu. Um, I have Coolpin Gorge, which at the time wasn't open to the general public, but I had friends who were working for the Aboriginal Legal Service and had um, friends in Aboriginal places and they, took, they allowed us onto their land to go. It was actually a hike and a kayak. Um, Catherine Gorge um, and throughout um, Kakadu. Um, I did the Larapinta Trail, which heads out west along the McDonald Ranges out of Alice. Um, that's a stunning walk. The full length is about 14 days. I did a seven day version of it. Um, and then let me see, that's the Australian desert. There's more that I want to do. I've done a little bit in WA, um, not a lot. Um, yeah, there's certainly more for me to do out that way. I've done a bit of hiking. I drove one year from Broome across to Kununurra and sort of did quite a lot of hiking along there and just sort of camped my way across. Um, one way or another, I've spent a bit of time, but not nearly enough. Mm. Yeah, I grew up um, camping every every weekend or every school holidays. It was always up, yeah. pack up and away we go, six weeks through the Kimberley. Um, so <laughs> probably got time for um, another question, um, maybe two if I group them together. Um, we've got a very interesting one about, um, this is more of a reading one. Um, so Trish wants to know, what book do you turn to when you feel you need to connect with what's important in your life? Um, Pima Chodron's When Things Fall Apart is certainly one. It's just got some beautiful reminders. Um, let me see. I'll read a bit of Virginia Woolf, A Room of One's Own. I just find her writing joyous. It is flirtatious. It's naughty. It, go, it, it goes a layer or two deeper, you know. She, mm -hmm. uh, she's not embarrassed of her tortured torturedness. And probably Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Um, it's a little, it's a small book and it's a good little reminder. I'm not somebody to read books twice, but um, they're books that I sort of... I won't necessarily read them again, but I'll go and search out passages that you know I'm reminded of, and I just I, I and I just need to hear singing uh, uh, prose that sings, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I I'm a I tend to be a bit of a novelty searcher. Um, it's not always a great attribute, but I've come to terms with it, and so I I just go seeking more and more to read. And I didn't grow up reading. I admit this, Cass, as you know in the book. You know, I, I was a lot of. I mean, I I was a philistine. I just didn't read any of that. Stuff. I went to schools where we didn't do literature. Um, so it's really only in very recent years that I've actually read deeply learned to appreciate art and literature. Mm, mm, yeah. Yeah, so I can't tell you how many bookmarks I have in Virginia Woolf's t um, To the Lighthouse. <laughs> I was thinking that when you said that about your light, that you write about lighthouses, yeah. <laughs> um, so final question, very interesting one from Sue. Uh, what are your thoughts, Sarah, on people walking around while looking at their phone? Oh, let me see now. You've got a word for this. What is it? Scro um... And we scroll. And <laughs> we scroll. Yeah. yeah, the bloody scrolling. Bloody scrolling. Um, I, I think you're missing an item of opportunity. While we're walking, is a great time to practice um, sort of uh, what's it called? Um, 
Oh, dopamine fasting. So dopamine fasting is taking off in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, ironically, which is where, of course, our attention economy, you know, got completely uh, ransacked. Um, and I think that when we're walking, it's a great opportunity to put your phone in your bag and preferably right at the bottom so that you're not tempted. Because we've got to do these kinds of things. I have to do it when I'm working. I go and put my phone in the room at the other end of the house in a drawer where I've actually got to go and you know actively go and get it um we've got to do these kinds of things because we are addicted so if you're walking see it as an absolute opportunity to listen and smell and smile at people people say you have all these opportunities that happen to you and you have these coincidences and maria shriver type things happen it's only because i'm paying attention I sat down in that cafe and I was talking to those ladies and I was talking to some other people. I was alive. I had my eyes wide open. Yeah. That's when life happens. And we've got to retrain ourselves. And in some ways, I know that Cass started this out with um, using the word fuck, so I feel like I can, I can do this. Um, when you put your phone away and you choose to live against that grain, that, that, that urge, it's sticking a finger <laughs> up to these um these forces that are getting that are buying our attention our attention is being bought every time we go on that phone and if anyone's wanting to watch a great um netflix um the social the social dilemma is that what's called um social dilemma it's about the way that our attention has been bought by these big global um you know, uh, tech companies. Ditto the rabbit hole is a podcast series in the New York Times, and it's fabulous. And we've got to we've got to get back our control. We've got to own our attention again. So yeah, mm. put the phone in the bottom of your bag so it's too hard to pull out. And I definitely think the Melbourne Writers Festival had the right idea with their theme this year, which is you know, are you paying attention? You can almost mm. see be seen on both ways as a you know. Um, a conscious thing and awareness, but then also the commodity side of it and yeah. attention being bought. So. Yeah, we're going to have to get very proactive and put up our own guardrails. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, I think um, we'll wrap up Q and A there. And um, Cass, um, or Sarah, would you like to sort of say any um, words before we uh, let everyone into the room to go wild and share? Yeah. <laughs> I'll just finish off. But if you want to say anything, Sarah. Yeah, just very, very briefly. Um, I just want to apologise to everyone who did actually book in for the other week. I'm really, really sorry. I don't normally do this. It's very unlike me, but I, I was quite unwell and um, my autoimmune uh, disease had flared and I had a terrible flare up where I was in a bit of a dark a dark place. So I don't normally cancel. And thank you so much um, to Avid Reader and to Cass as well for accommodating that and to all of you who've had to rebook in another time. So thank you. And uh, I can't wait to be in Brisbane, February 2021, doing a bit more of a book tour. So hopefully I'll see some of you there. Fabulous. Maybe in person. In person. Yes, that's the aim. That's it. Oh, I just wanted to finish by um, holding up this wonderful book again, um, which really does encourage all of us to live this one wild and precious life, to appreciate the journey and to activate the activist in all of us to help change the world one small action at a time. It's inspirational. It's relatable. It would make an ideal gift for anyone who's interested in living their best life reconnecting with others in a more meaningful way and getting in touch with nature, of course. Um, so thank you very much, Sarah, for a very inspiring conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Cass. Thank you, Care. Thank you so much, thank Sarah. You over there in, up there in Brisbane. Uh, can't wait for that border to open and come and join yeah, us. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to just um, give a special shout out and a special mention to Cass for being our wonderful in conversation partner yeah. as always. Our fabulous questions. Um, I'm now going to unmute everyone and we can all join in on a round of applause and, um, and then we'll be leaving you to enjoy your evenings and... Um, we go so you'll be able to unmute yourself manually from there and um we can all celebrate um, thank you so much sarah that was a great conversation <laughs> really great conversation. and thank you for, for joining everyone and uh have a wonderful weekend thank you, thank you. Okay. Yeah, here comes everybody what you like shop <laughs> yes support your local bookshop wherever that may be wherever you're zooming in from 
Yeah, preferably avid. Preferably avid, but you know. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Andra. Yeah, the messages are flooding in. I hope you can see those too, Sarah. <laughs> Thank I you so much, everyone. Bring them up now. Oh, yes, I can see them now. Oh, thank you, Trish, Tara, Beck. Thank you. Very nice. Very lovely crew. It's lovely to see your face. And, and I will, um, Donna, thank you for the Trent Dalton suggestion. I'll go and um, hunt down the paper today. Um, I've got to head off to a dinner with a friend who's booked a babysitter. So I can't be late. Time is of the essence. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much again, Enjoy. Sarah. Thank yeah. you, everybody, for joining us. Bye. 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 That was great.